Okay, let's pray. Thanks, Father God, for those who did really well on the other test, and I pray that they'd enjoy the reward. Bless this time now as we look into your word again and fill us with the Lord Jesus. We pray that we'd understand him better and what he wants from us and cooperate with his grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Last time we were talking about communion with Jesus and as part of abiding and that communion involves communication. There's two ways that communication happens in the abiding life. One, he communicates us to us with his words, right? And so we have to store those words in our hearts. He says, if my words abide in you, that is, if my words live in your hearts. That's the idea. So uh, if, uh, if you, his word is living in your heart, then he's communicating with you. You're getting to know his thoughts. And you're understanding what he wants. Secondly, there's our part in the communication, and that is we are asking whatever we desire. We are talking to him. So it's a two-way street in communication as far as Jesus is concerned with you. Four, thanks, oh, thank you. Ah, my angel, my angel has given me what my heart desires here. Mm. Thanks, babe. Fourth, abiding means a dependent submission in obedience to Christ. A dependent submission in obedience to Christ. The branch does not live on its own. The branch depends completely on the vine in order for the branch to bear fruit. In the same way, the Christian depends completely on the Lord Jesus. And in that dependence, it means that we submit our will to him and we obey him. Obey him. Uh, you remember what Jesus said to the disciples? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? If we call him Lord, it means that we're saying we're obedient to Jesus Christ. And that obedience is part of the abiding life. It means that we submit to him and we obey him. Um, and this will be, you're, you're at a critical stage in your lives. Um, many of you are going to be deciding who you're going to marry in the, in the years to come. Some of you are going to be tempted to not marry and instead live in a situation that Jesus is grieved by. Some of you are going to even be tempted in the days in which we live to uh, commit your life to a person who is not of the correct gender to marry, as far as the scripture is concerned. Some of you are going to be tempted to take jobs that will end up compromising what you, what you said you believe. All those temptations and many, many others are out there. There will always be the temptation in these days to just go for as much as I can get and, uh, and have the lifestyle that everybody wants and have all the money streaming in, make the six figures or seven, and just spend my whole life geared on that. All of those are ways of taking your will out from under the Lord Jesus. You cannot abide in Christ and give in on situations like that. If you do, it costs you your abiding life. We talked yesterday about grieving the Holy Spirit. You can't stay filled with the Holy Spirit if you disobey him and end up grieving him. Uh, I don't want to harp on this because obviously you've been hearing a lot of it this last year, but it's true. If you want to abide in Jesus, you have to submit your will to him. If you want to abide in Jesus, you have to do what he says. 
that obedience will be part of the fruit that the abiding life produces. But it's, of course, it's up to you whether or not uh, you switch on the obedience, uh, you flip the obedience switch. I went to school, we were talking with Rick the other day about some of the classmates that we had at Cape and Ray. And these were people we dearly loved. Uh, some of these people were in our wedding. And these, these were people that uh, were precious to us and we cared about deeply. And yet now some of them have left the Christian faith. Some don't actively profess to be Christians anymore. Uh, some are left in, lived in situations that grieve the Lord. Some change their whole priorities uh, system. And uh, as a result, they're not walking with him now. You say, well, were they ever the Lord's? In some cases, I, don't, I, I really can't say. Only God knows. God knows the heart, and I don't know the heart. And God knows the relationship between him and them. But the fruit they were producing was not the fruit of an abiding life. So count the cost. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, there is a cost to pay. And the number one cost is obedience. Is obedience. If you want to follow him, you have to obey him. And that means submitting your will to him. Any questions on that? Does that sound harsh? It's not. Part of that, ob of that abiding is simply his love for you. He loves you. And he wants you to stay in that abiding relationship with him. He wants to keep you filled with his spirit. He wants to keep uh, that communion going with you all the time. Because there's not only so much that he wants to bless you with, so much that he wants to give you, so much that he wants to do through you, but it's also so much that he wants to protect you from, keep you from. So let him do it. Stay under the shepherd's crook and submit your will and obey him. Jesus put it this way. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. I want you to remain, stay in, in fellowship with my love. We say, how do I do that, Lord Jesus? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So, just as we saw that diagram before, the Lord Jesus, as both deity and humanity, submitted totally in obedience to God the Father. And so he would abide in the love of God the Father. With us, we're human beings, but we stay in an, a love relationship with Jesus by obeying him. We obey Christ the way that he obeyed his father. And we do it because we're filled with Jesus. Jesus did it because he was filled with his father by the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay. You say, well, how do I know if I'm abiding? He makes it real simple. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be what? Full. 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 So the question is, am I joyful? Am I joyful? The depth and length of your abiding determines the fullness of your joy. The more you abide in Jesus, the deeper you're abiding in Jesus, the more of his joy he shares with you, the more of his peace he shares with you. The less you abide in Jesus, the more joy you're going to miss out on. You're not going to have that joy that you would love to have and that he would love you to have. Okay, makes sense? That's the abiding life. Now, In many cases, as I said, when you leave here and you'll come into situations, some of which are challenging, you're going to want to go back to the way things were. By that I mean, 
you're going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to please you no matter what. I'm going to show you what a great Christian I am. And I'm going to get out there and just, you know, keep all the commandments, do all the whole nine yards. And uh, that reminds me very much of a person who gets a brand new Ferrari. We talked about the law Ferrari in the last one. Who gets a brand new Ferrari in their, uh, their driveway for their birthday or Christmas or whatever. And all their friends drop over and, you know, they want to get their picture taken with the car. And, yeah, you're giving them thumbs up. And then uh, the next day, you want to go out and test it, right? So suddenly, they're driving along and they see you by the side of the road. And here you are pushing that Ferrari. And they say, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? You say, I'm, I'm pushing my Ferrari. I'm living the life that I've always wanted to live as a Ferrari owner. And they have to point out to you, no, 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 the Ferrari has an engine that'll beat the band. Go ahead and get inside and turn the keys and find out. That's what living the abiding life is like. The Christian life isn't pushing the Ferrari. And there are thousands of people that I know who, have, who are out there trying to push the Ferrari. The Christian life is getting inside turning the keys and letting that thing whisk you away. That's what Jesus is like. He's the power. Let him empower your life. Let him do the job of living his life through you. Yes, there will be situations where you don't know what to do. Yes, there will be situations that are over your head. So what do you say? Lord Jesus, I can't. And you never said I could. But Lord Jesus, you can, and you always said you would. So let him do the living through you, the challenges through you. Let him work out his life uh, as you abide in him. He's the engine. He'll get, he'll get you where you need to go, but you have to abide in him to see it happen. Okay? Any questions? Believe me, this lesson that we just had in, in uh, John 15, this will be your big test case from here on out. Day after day, the big choice will be, do I abide in Jesus? Do I let him abide in me? Today, this hour, this minute. From here on, it's abiding in Jesus and him and you. Okay? All right. Now we're going to come to, uh, we looked at uh, most of, the, of chapter 16 yesterday, and now we're going to come to the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus. So let's, let's pass those out. The high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 17, We switch gears because Jesus is no longer teaching. Jesus is now interceding. He's praying. Up to this point, he has been in communion with his disciples. In the next chapter, he's going to be in, his, in communion with his father. He's going to be in communion with his father. And the disciples are going to hear it. They're going to be in on it. So even though the Lord Jesus isn't teaching, the things which he says are so amazing during his prayer that the Apostle John related it many years later so that we could hear it, rejoice in it, and understand it. And as he prayed, he demonstrates in those few minutes that the prayer was going, at whatever spot they had arrived on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, they may have even gotten to the edge of the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, some of the, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, Passion of the Christ, they've got it, that prayer going on right at the edge of the, at the garden. It may have been there. But in any case, the disciples heard it, they remembered it. 
But as Jesus prayed, and he gave them a preview of what he's doing right now, because he, he ever lives, it says, to make intercession for us. Were we short on that? Uh, if we're short, I can give you. I can give him my copy. Okay. And as he prayed, he gave them an illustration of the life he's living right now. Uh, the New Testament uh, tells us that he is ever living to make intercession for us. So right now, Jesus is interceding and praying for us all the time. He's praying for you constantly before the Father. But he's going to say some things that are going to be controversial. In fact, they're even controversial for Christians. They shouldn't be because it's coming from Jesus. But uh, nevertheless, it is because the, the, the fleshly mind rejects a lot of what Jesus is going to say in this, in, this, uh, in this prayer. So with that in mind, let's pray again as we come into this last section. Uh, let's pray again and ask the Lord Jesus to uh, remove those obstacles from our own minds, okay? Father God, thank you for our Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is our high priest. He is our shepherd. He is our king. In his name, that we can understand what you have for us in this prayer that he makes in John 17. Remove the obstacles that our flesh is prone to raise at the very hearing of some of these words. Help us understand just how sovereign you are and help us rejoice in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, Ken Needham, was the first person that I heard this from, uh, that, I, that I heard this truth from. And uh, do you, did Ken, Ken's been here, right? Yeah. yeah. You remember Ken pretty well? Good. I remember what he said that day, and uh, he, he said, uh, uh, he kind of does this. You know, Ken always does this. It's the start of when he's going to talk. He said, now, now, don't be rattled by what I'm about to tell you with regard to election and predestination. He says, just think of a mountain. He says, and they're digging into that mountain, and they come in so many hundreds of feet, and he says, and there is your name carved out there. Thousands of years ago, before the rest of the world existed, he said, that's how long God has loved you. And that is how long God has loved us. And we're going to get a picture of that. I can't picture his face, but I can picture his voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I deeply love Ken. And he is our, he is our children's uh, adopted grandparent. Uh, they, they love Ken. He's, he's helped to raise them. Um, Let's read, you've got the sheet here for John 17. Uh, let's read John 17 uh, as in the verses that are printed here, okay? And take note of the, the key words are give, given, gave, okay? Jesus spoke, let's all read together. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. 
and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And then down to verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Okay, now, uh, according to this, according to this prayer that Jesus is giving here, what is eternal life? This is not on the sheet. This, I'm just asking you. What does it say he says eternal life is? What does Jesus say eternal life is? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Yes. Eternal life is not only a life for all eternity, a life without end. Eternal life is qualitative which means that it's a quality of life. You know the true God. You know Jesus Christ, whom that true God has sent. Does that just mean academic knowledge? What kind of knowledge do you think he's after here? What kind of knowledge is he after? Yes. of God is what eternal life is because we're all going to live forever anyway but whether that's in hell or whether that's in heaven so like you said like the quality of our life whether we're in the presence of God or whether we're um, cast out from that presence yeah what, and, and so knowing that God that we're in the presence of it's like experiencing yes it's an experiential knowledge a full knowledge a deep personal, spiritual acquaintance with, a love for. All of those things are involved in that word know. You remember uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, it said Adam knew his wife. And she conceived and bore a son. So knowing doesn't just mean knowing about it in your head, does it? It means something deep. It means a personal, intimate, loving acquaintance. Okay, so that's what that eternal life really is. If that's the case, then according to chapter 17 and verse 2, to whom is eternal life given? To whom is eternal life given? What does he say? Who gets that eternal life? Oh, you know what? <laughs> we forgot. Where's Cooper? Maybe Sean can uh, can help me out here. I forgot to change gears on the. I forgot to change gears on on this one. So let me just quit out of this. All right, and go over to Given. All right. So I just clicked on given. And then we go up here. No, it's already connected. Oh, it's already on. Okay. Uh, so, okay, awesome. Great, thank you. 
Who knows, maybe by the time I leave, I'll actually know how to do this. Jesus is praying for the given. Now, I, I want to caution you that um, some of you hey, may have heard these things and A, not understood it, or B, not liked it, or C, outright rejected it. And that's because the truths that Jesus is going to give out here go against our fleshly mind. We like to think of ourselves as little islands unto ourself, powers unto ourself. We don't like to think that any other force outside ourself has anything to do with our destiny. We don't like to think that someone else may have planned our very existence or someone else may have planned what he wanted to do with us. And so it goes against the grain to give in to what Jesus is going to say here. But what he says, as he has told us again and again, is true. So according to 17.2, to whom is eternal life given? What does he say? Yes, that he should give eternal life as you, God the Father, have given him, Jesus Christ, authority over all flesh that he, that is Christ, should give eternal life to as many as you, the Father, have given him. Now, from the disciples' vantage point, it sounded very like open and shut. Jesus says, come, follow me. I say, hmm, now let me think about that. Yeah, okay, great. I'll come and follow you. And so they come and follow him. And it was their decision as far as they were concerned. But as far as God is concerned, something else is going on. Number one, the Father had them before. As Jesus says, they were yours. You gave them to me. The Father had them. And then the Father gave them to the Son. Guess what? It isn't just true of those 11 disciples. It is also true of you. The Father had you. You were the fathers. You didn't know it, but you were the fathers. And the Father gave you to Jesus Christ. Who are the given then? In verse two, in those verse two, the ones you get, who've given uh, as many as you have given him. Who are the given? Gave eternal life to as many as you were given. Well, let's find out. Let's look at some parallels first from John's gospel. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Now watch this. All that the Father, what? Gives me. All that the Father gives me shall or will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And he continues. For I have come down from heaven, Jesus says, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but there are several descriptions of the people that Jesus is interacting with. Here's what, what he calls them. Note the parallels. He says, he who comes to me. And then he says, all that the Father gives me. And again, all that he has given me. And then everyone who sees the Son who believes in him. These are all the same people. And they all have eternal life through Jesus. So Jesus is saying that the, the person who sees the Son and believes in him are the same persons who 
were the fathers and the father gave them to the Lord Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. When were they the fathers? Yes. So that sounds like a Christ the human wants to take control of our destiny. Uh, sorry, could you slow down just a little bit? Say that again. I don't want to sound like a prideful human who's trying to take control of his own destiny, but do we have like any choice on whether or not we go to heaven or hell? Or is this something that like there's some for heaven and some for not? Okay, I want you to save that. I want you to, that's an excellent question. And I want you to save it till we get through and, and then we'll bring it out again. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And if I forget, you know, remind me. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to ask, if these are all the same people, he who comes to me, all that the Father gives me, all he has given me, everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. If they're the same people and they all have eternal life through Jesus, how did they get there? And the answer that Jesus says here is the, the Father first gave them to the Son. Okay, let's find out some more about that. Go back up to John uh, 17 here. He says, as you have given him authority over all flesh. If you want to sit back here, Cooper, you can. Not a problem. Uh, here in John 17, he says, As you've given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And again, I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Now keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So we have to ask the question then. When were they the fathers before they were the sons? When did the father give them to the son? He's going to give you some hints here. For instance, in 17.5. Anyone want to read 17.5 for us? <coughs> What's it say? <coughs> and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the Ah, before the world existed. All right. How about 24? What's it say? 1724. 1724. Anybody? Okay. Thanks. Father, I want those who have chosen me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world. So it's before the world existed, before the creation of the world. These are some hints Jesus is giving here. And he's going to uh, not just hint, but give a lot clearer picture in the rest of Scripture. Uh, back, back. Turn it. No, no. Back. Turn it back. Okay. <laughs> From the rest of Scripture. Uh, this is Paul writing in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through verse 6. And this, this is the part where Ken told me to not worry about it. Okay? And so I'm telling you the same. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Okay, Paul. God's blessed me with, a he with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What are those spiritual blessings? By the way, this is one long sentence in the Greek from verse 3 all the way through verse 14. It's all one sentence. He's just packing participle after participle and stacking them up. Here's the first blessing. He said in verse 4, just as he what? Chose us. Chose us. He chose us. In him. In who? The Father 
chose us in Christ. When? What time? Before the world. Before the world began. Before the foundation of the world. Exactly the same phrase that Jesus used in John 17. Paul does that on purpose. Paul does that on purpose. Okay, so it's, it's before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having what? Predestined. predestined us. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, what was the Father's attitude toward us when he made that choice and when he made that predestining um, decision? What was his attitude towards us? What does he say? According to the good pleasure of his will. It was according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, it was God's sovereign decision, but it was also in love. He loved us in advance. Now, Paul is very careful here. He doesn't, to get back to your question, uh, doesn't say anything about the people who are not chosen. From a divine standpoint, that's none of our business. What he does with them, how he, how he deals with them, he doesn't go into that here. All he deals with and all we really have to go on is how, what he says is true for us. What he says is true for us. And that is that he loved us before the world began. So as Jesus says, they were yours. That is, the Father had made that choice. The Father had made that decision. They were yours and you gave them to me, Jesus says. That's when we came to Christ. That's when we believed in Christ. You say, well, does that mean that we don't have any decision power of our own? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Your decision, my decision for Jesus Christ was an absolute, valid, 100% uh, human decision. It was, a, it was a bona fide human decision. We really made that decision. But the reason that we were able to make that decision was because he disposed us to make that decision. And that's because he had already chosen us and already destined us. He was wooing us. He was, as Jesus says in John 6, drawing us. He was moving us over to his side. As he says a little later in Romans 8, he calls us. But that call is also an effectual call. And he energizes us to do what God wanted us to do. Does that make sense? Well, it sounds like almost contradictory. Because it's so hard to... I have a hard time understanding the fact that God... ...chose him. And that we chose him because he chose us to, chose, to choose him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, uh, when a little kid gets his favorite chocolate cake on his birthday and just plows into it. I mean, it gets all over his face and the mommy and daddy are taking pictures to show the grandparents, you know, that this is what your little grandchild just did. Uh, so everyone can uh, whoop it up and they're very glad. Was it th that baby's choice to plow into that chocolate cake? It was. It, you bet it was. Who provided the chocolate cake? Mom and dad. Did mom and dad know that he would dive right into that cho chocolate cake? You bet they did. <laughs> because it was his favorite. That's why they made it. But it was his choice as well. So was it their choice or was it his choice that he plowed into the chocolate cake? It was both. It was both. Does that make sense? Okay. Homely illustration. Uh, you won't find it in any theology book. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's true.
Yes. Where he decides to save some. Yes, Trent. Right. In fact, he tells he tells uh, Israel, "You go and and win those people, those other nations, uh, to me." Right. And they, how they were, like you know, sinning and unfaithful to him. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, this choice is is it, it is true that he he chose Israel as his chosen people, in the sense of them being the ones that I, I realize we're out of time now. Uh, then being the ones that he was going to have a relationship with against all others. This choice is deeper. Uh, this is one that, as he says, starts from before the foundation of the world. And in this choice, he decides to unite us to Jesus Christ. He didn't do that with the decision in Israel. He didn't unite them to Christ. In this one, he's decided to unite them to Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, our time is up, and we've got to stop there. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll take it up um, tomorrow, tomorrow morning.